Okay, so here we go. We're going to start with women's clothing in the bustle period first. The bustle period. 1870 to 1890. These 20 years are going to be characterized by the silhouette of back fullness achieved by the wearing of something called a bustle. A bustle. A bustle is the name of the underproper that was used to, to cause these back fullness silhouettes, but it also refers to the style of dress as well. Now we know that at the end of the crinoline period, there was a movement from the big dome-shaped skirts towards a silhouette with the concentration with the boof in the back. And what we're going to see in this 20 years is actually how the shape of this back fullness is going to change. There are three distinct styles. The gay 90s is a completely different thing that we're going to skip for now. So let's go to the bustle period. Okay, three styles of bustle. First, we've got 1870-1878. and This is what I refer to and I believe your book refers to as a draped bustle style. You've got a full bustle effect in the back but it's created primarily by lots of fabric and how it's draped towards the back of the skirt. It's a fuller look, it's a fluffier look, and sometimes it can be a chubbier look because there's just lots of floofy fabric in this look. The second type of bustle is from 78 to 83, and I refer to this as the sheath, or another word for it is a cuirass bustle. A cuirass was the word for um, uh, breastplate or something that's fitted really, really tightly to the body. And you will see that these are quite snug. Some emphasis towards the rear, but not as big as before. And then in 84 to 90, we get something that I call the shelf bustle. It's a just a big old straight almost shelf-like, almost horizontal projection in the rear. It doesn't look soft and fluffy. It looks very tailored. Upper body is pretty slim fitting, and then the bustle juts up out a lot in the back. And I hope you'll see what I see. When I look at these, I see almost a horse-like silhouette. So anyway, let's, let's explore these three different looks. Okay, we're going to start with undergarments, like we usually do. And ladies are wearing a chemise and drawers still. But there is a new undergarment that comes out called a combination. And basically that was a chemise and the drawers combined into one garment. It had less bulk because you didn't have the waistbands going on. So we've got, uh, 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 it's kind of an all-in-one kind of thing. There's also a corset, of course, and as we go through these two decades, you're going to see that the corset will change shape somewhat. And as the crinoline ones got quite shorter, we're going to get longer again and curved. The idea of a, of a very full matronly bosom is nice, a narrow waist and smooth hips. And when we get to the sheath bustle look, the corset's even more important to keep everything sucked in to get a much slimmer line. And then, of course, the bustle itself. And there are tons of different ways that people uh, created these underproppers. We're going to look at several of them. But know that there were different um, styles of bustles, different manufacturers that made them, different products they were made out of. So there's a lot of different choices um, to fulfill the look for all of these three different uh, shapes. Sometimes they're cages, sometimes they're butt pads, sometimes they're hoops. You'll see what I mean. And then on top of that, uh, we're also going to have petticoats. And just like everything else, when the skirts get slimmer, the petticoats get slimmer. When the skirts are fuller, there's their fuller petticoats. So those are also going to help uh, 
cover over the bustle so that it doesn't um uh, you don't see as many like ribs of a cage or whatever but there will be a petticoat worn so here is a really interesting uh, uh, painting by Monet called Nana and it's a woman in a corset from this time period and her drawers that are kind of full and fluffy this is a very interesting silhouette you can see that in this picture at least she her tummy is kind of protruding in this and there's much more of a bend to her back so the corset helps achieve that kind of a look here are some corsets from this time period and you can see they all kind of have the basic front shape but they're different styles um and and they could be quite fancy and decorated as you can see the one on the bottom is embroidered and has lace and you know could be very very fancy here's a couple more and won't we'll, embroidered and laced and whatever um you'll notice down the front these two open up down the front which we really haven't seen before and it's got instead of a wooden or bone or whatever shaped busk that goes down the front to uh secure the the rigidity of the the front of the thing these have a, a metal busk with like hooks and eyes so that you can open it and get in and out of it quicker which was a nice accommodation you can see especially on the blue one see how the shape comes down and uh so in the bottom of the blue corset can you see this like blue spoon like area here I'm hoping you can. So here is an image of a pair of combinations, and you can't see that this is all one piece underneath, but it is. It's the combinations, drawers and, and chemise, with a corset on top, and in the back, that little wire cage thing is one variation on the bustle form. So here's a nice little thing of what a lady in her underwear might look like but the bustle pad or the bustle under proper itself is going to have lots of different possible shapes in order to achieve the different silhouette of these different looks uh different structures were created to kind of make that look and you'll see everything from something like this that is made out of fabric with um, hoop steel or wicker or whatever and this you can see has got uh, a uh, waistband seam and then this tail like thing hangs in the back and this is another real nice set of uh, combinations with uh, you know a nice drawers and a, and a corset cover but here are some these are from a catalog where you could order ready-made uh, corset pads and we've got a bunch of different styles everything from rows of stiff pleats to uh, things that look like what we just looked like looked at with like this fishtail almost of of half hoops to things that look like uh, very simple weird shaped pillows. Here are some existing ones from museums, um, and you can see the one on the top left looks like wire springs. We've got things that look like uh, they were made out of. Um, horsehair braid and ruffles or some kind of wire mesh and then uh, steel banding in kind of a uh, hoops half hoops shape so there's there's lots of different types of bustle pads available and here's some more things from uh, catalogs and you notice the price like 65 cents 33 cents 25 cents it's amazing the one on the right was like two uh, channels in a, in a fabric thing that had stuffing inside. So it was more like a, a, a pillow shaped, a pillow softness bustle thing. Here's some wire ones held together by tapes. And some of the wire, like the one on the left, has really strange shapes to it. And here are some that uh, are made with fabric in different ways to have different kinds of of hoopy like bustle things in the back they're very bizarre some of these some of these are pretty crazy 
Oh, and the one in the middle on the black dress form is made out of, like, rattan. So, crazy stuff. In the theater, we would probably make it as easy as possible to get the look we wanted. Here's a really interesting shot from the movie Anna Karenina. There's a scene where she gets dressed, and uh, this is an interesting shot from behind of, of her maid helping her get dressed. So, the dresses themselves are, there's several different kinds, and, and there are many, 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 many. Did you hear me say many? Lots of different uh, results within each one of these categories. So there's there's one piece dresses that were referred to as princess style because of the princess line seams. And virtually these didn't have a waistline seam. There were lots of seams and darts and whatever to go over the bust and down through the waist and past. And, and then were shaped to go over whatever kind of a bustle there that was being worn with this and then there were um these two part dresses that were really the most popular some kind of matching bodice and skirt and oftentimes the bodice would um have a, either look like a jacket or have little peplum type deals or whatever and then there were skirts and blouses they're not as obvious and you don't find as many examples of skirts and blouses but I've got uh, one little picture from a magazine to show you what I'm talking about. So let's look at day dresses for the first section, what we're calling the draped bustle style, 1870 to 78. Uh, the bodices themselves, lots of jacket style things with little short or long basques. Um, oh, when you see these C figure whatevers, it depends on what textbook you have I should probably delete those so sorry but anyway um, we're gonna start out uh, with skirts that are are pretty pretty full because this is like we're transitioning from the crinoline look into what we're calling the draped bustle the necklines on these dresses high and closed is still around a lot but every once in a while you are going to see a daytime dress that will have a little bit of skin showing with a square or a V-shaped neckline. And usually those suckers were filled in with some kind of a lace frill or a little tucker kind of thing or a chemisette kind of thing. Um, this lady in this drawing looks like she's got a little blouse kind of dicky stuck into her neckline. The back neckline sometimes could be higher up on the neck, which is a kind of really cool look on stage. Here's a couple things from catalogs. Uh, that show this transition style thing and a couple of choices for little chemisette or collar deals but you'll see there's there's more than one skirt there's there's an upper skirt or an overskirt that's been draped and then some kind of a fancy petticoat that matches underneath and both of these examples have rows of ruffles but here's the kind of silhouette i want you to think about is the transition silhouette we are going from the crinoline into a back emphasis. Here is something from 1872, and, and, and I think, for me, the identifying characteristic between what is the first, the, the one in the middle, the sheath is easy to recognize, but the one that's first, the 18, early 1870s, and then the one that's last, the, the shelf bustle, the difference is the softness. If you can look at the silhouette here, this profile, um, we see an overskirt and an underskirt, but the brown is just kind of draped, and sometimes there's a ploops on this. But it looks soft, not hard, and tailored. Um, here's a portrait from 1870, and you can see her overskirt is plooped up in a different way. Lots of these are very different. Um, this is an outdoor uh, skirt and jacket kind of thing, um, probably for, for more recreational activities. Uh, this is a painting by my very favorite painter from the, the uh, Victorian era, James Tissot. He painted so many beautiful portraits of women in the crinoline and in the bustle period. Um, and he gets, th his, his, his portraits kind of are like the epitome of what this, Drape bustle look is frothy, lots of ruffles, lots of ploopage, lots of you know uh, uh, applied 
trim and ruffles and bows and all that kind of gee gaws. Here are some day dresses from this time period, and you can tell there's there there. You can see the how how we've translated from crinoline into this. There's still uh, the, some width in the in the diameter of the skirt. It flows out still just a little bit on at least the blue one and the yellow one. Here's a, a promenade or walking dress, and we can see that things are getting just a tidge slimmer, but it's still a softer, more uh, uh, ploopy fabric look. These these are good examples of what I'm talking about. And the the dress on the right has a bit of, of a, it almost looks like an apron in the front. Oftentimes the overskirt were, was draped, almost look apron-like, but this one has that, you know, specifically built in. And here's another painting from this time period, and you can see the woman's overskirt has that wonderful hanging fringe on it, almost like a big, looks like a big shawl that's been all plooped up. And here's an example from Godey's Ladies' Book in, 19, in 1874, and you can see there's lots of fabric the the bodices are not particularly slimming like they're going to be. We're going to see sleeves that have belled ends or they're just fuller sleeves than what we will see in the draped bodice look. Here is a dress by Charles Frederick Worth. It was called a reception dress if you're going to a fancy uh, official uh, a reception. And you can see that the purple overskirt has been pulled across the front brought to the back and plooped into puff in the back and revealing the lighter colored underskirt. Here is another variation on that theme. This was actually worn as a wedding dress um, by I believe Marjorie Merriweather Post in uh, the DC area, heiress to the uh, Post Serials fortune, I believe. A friend of mine is curator at that museum, which is kind of cool. He's got a new book out on this. And here's a here's a fashion uh, a plate from 1875. We're about to transition into the next thing. You can see the overskirt is very elaborate, has a kind of a embroidered pa panel in the front, and then plooped up lots of uh, pleats in the overskirt, big heavy tasseled trim, and then a very elaborate underskirt as well. So we've got all kinds of examples and as we get closer to 1877 we're seeing things slim down a little in the front can you see that the skirt itself even though there's lots of fabric there is not quite as wide in the hem uh, here's an actual photograph from 1875 you can see tons of fabric of plaid fabric in that dress and this is an afternoon dress done by Worth this would have had some kind of fill in in the neck I believe um, but you can see, again, the different sections and how they're connected. And then in the back, this has a little bit of a train. Um, this wouldn't be worn, you know, out shopping. This would have been worn to some kind of event in the afternoon. And then the princess line. I mentioned the princess line. Here's an example of what a princess line dress in the bustle period might look like. If you can see the upper layer of this lovely sage green uh, silk, it, it keep, it, there's no waistline seam. It keeps going down. There's There are lines, uh, seam lines, that go over the bust and then all the way down on that overskirt part. And in the back, you can see how it's shaped with seams to go over the bustle pad. So that's what I mean by a princess line. There's no waistline seam. It's been patterned to fit over whatever interesting shape the the silhouette is. Daytime dresses are have sleeves that aren't dropped arms eye anymore. They they fit into a natural shoulder seam on the top of the shoulder. Sometimes they're close fitting. Sometimes they're even three quarters length. Sometimes they have lace cuffs. They can be really poofy. Here's some examples. Um, you can see several of these have uh, like fancy cuffs on them or the one in the center, a wonderful example of a squared neckline there with, with a little bit of, of frill inside, and lots of lace, kind of reminiscence almost of 18th century, uh, engageant, 18th century kind of things, or they could be a little bit more tailored with a cuff or what have you, but lots of variations on a theme. The skirts, 
usually matched the bodice. Uh, and there would probably be an overskirt and an underskirt. Oftentimes draped like an apron in the front and then lots of soft fullness in the back. And these are complicated. The way that they are plooped up and contained is complicated. The way the trim is put on them is complicated. So uh, there are tons of variations. And here's just like three and there's thousands. Um, the one on the left is the real simple version. If you look at this, the overskirt, the brown overskirt has been uh, almost like a, a curtain has been brought up and the other ones are much more complicated but every one of these is really really unique and here's an example of that blouse I was talking about it, this would be worn uh, with a skirt and then belted this one's got kind of like a belt in area in the middle and sometimes worn with a jacket sometimes worn as a blouse and skirt but it's really hard to find examples of these if you look in some mail order catalogs you might find but it's not the upper middle to upper class preferred garment but they did exist just so you know cuz this idea of a blouse and skirt is really going to take off in the gay 90s and i mentioned a princess skirt that is reminiscent of the polonaise dress of the 18th century uh it would have the outer skirt plooped up in puffs and here's an example this one was referred to as a dolly varden poly, po polonaise dress it's plooped up in several sections and and it was a little bit unique so evening dresses we've got the same difference from daytime dresses that we've had before the necklines are usually uh, much more revealing even, no matter what shape they are they wouldn't fill them in to cover the skin and the sleeves are short or even sleeveless unless you are a very uh, conservative lady and some of these even go off the shoulder. Um, here is a, this is a evening reception dress. So this is not like a ball gown. That's why it's, it covers the body more. But this is a wonderful example of the overskirt that's pulled up like, like curtains. And another reception dress by Worth. And then a dinner gown. So I, I mentioned to you before that there's all these different types of dresses for different types of events. It's so regimented and so expensive, I think. But do you see how it looks soft and fluffy and as if, if she fell on the back end, it wouldn't hurt her? It just is kind of uh, uh, puffy and fluffy. And as we move towards 1877, we're getting a little thinner. This one is a velvet one and has a little bit of a train. This is a more conservative or older ladies dress. It's not worn to a ball, but it's probably for entertaining at home or whatever. And then, okay, this is just a drawing of an evening gown when we're getting close to the sheath look. Uh, short, short sleeves, almost sleeveless. And here's one that is little tiny cap sleeves from right as we're turning to go to the sheath look and a lot of times ladies uh, were, were very smart they would have two bodices made for skirts so they'd have an evening one and a daytime one and they could use the same skirt that's pretty smart for middle class people so when we move to the next style I think I better have a new slide or a new video for this so let's stop